From time to time, everything drops into place on a fishing match, and recently it was my turn on the new fish feeder king. So here are 10 snippets of information that helped me to get over the line to win this fantastic trophy and pick up that great big check. I'm going to share them with you to help you to share in that success. So first and foremost, and probably the most important thing for fishing, and especially to win matches, is bait. It's paramount. Deciding which bait for the right venue, and in this circumstances at Southfield, for me, it's quite a simple choice. There's big bream and there's skimmers in here, but at the moment there's quite a few small fish. So what I've decided, and, and after practice, was that I needed a fairly strong mix. So my ground bait of choice is 50-50 method in green, cut with, F1 green. Both green ground baits because for some reason, I don't know if it's the clarity of the water or the colour of it, greens always work really well for me here at Southfield. This is a really strong mix. It's got halibut pellets in it and it's got uh, coarse green pellets in it. And this one is slightly sweeter and more of an expander based. But the two mixed together will give me the perfect mix to catch skimmers and more importantly, big green to get you over the line. So obviously feeder fishing here, you don't need tons of bait and despite the fact that I've just won 10k, I still don't want to waste any ground bait. So I take a measure, I have a pint and half of each, there's a pint of each of those, half of the 50-50, I'll just top that up with the F1 green. So I've basically got a pint and half of each of the ground baits, in they go, into the bucket and then to that I will add just underneath the pint and on this particular tub it's just underneath the lip like so and that I want that to go in and soak in and what I try and do I'm just going to give that a quick whisper I'll come back to you in a minute with that is I like to do that as early as I can in the day even if you can do it at home before you come and let that soak up so that it's thoroughly soaked right through to all the grains and all swelled so that you're not getting an active ground bit I'm fishing on the bottom the skimmers are on the bottom the bream are down there I don't want any fizzing so that over wetted, it'll come back to ready when you're fishing to be absolutely perfect. The consistency I'm looking for from my ground bit here is basically I need it to be damp so that if you squeezed it, if you were throwing it in by hand for instance, you could actually make a ball. But the reason why I want that is it's very shallow, I'm not squeezing it into my feeder too hard, so I need it to be damp enough so I can get a gentle squeeze without it clogging up. So a good damp, you can feel it, and you any more water and that'd be over the edge. That is the perfect consistency for what I like to use at Southfield. The second most important thing and the second tip is obviously what bait you're going to put in with that ground bait because ground bait can't do the job on its own. I suppose the most important part of this little quartet is the humble dendrobina. And here at Southfield, these play a massive part. But quantities and how you introduce them is something we're going to in detail later. But worms is the staple diet of these fish in here. To couple with that, because we've got skimmers and we're looking for solitary bream, there's nothing more precious than fantastic red worms. These are all from the horse muck and they're Yorkshire born and bred. Look at them, absolutely fantastic. So important at this reservoir. And then, depending on the time of year and depending on how the fish are feeding, I always carry some red and some floral maggots. These are amazing hook baits nice and bright and sometimes and don't ask me why because I'm not a scientist the fish just want to pick one of them up whether it's a sight thing whether it's the way they're feeding whether it's the, the feel in the mouth I don't really know but I always carry them as a change up bait because sometimes you can just change your up bait on here and that tip will go around and it'll get you that most important fish that once again will get you where you need to be that might seem quite simple and you could be wondering where the dead maggots are, where the dead pinkies are, and where the all-important casters are. After all, we are bream fishing. Me, personally, I only like to feed here what I'm actually going to try and put on the hook. It's not a great big deep reservoir where I've got to kind of hold a shoal. In my mind, and I'll go into this in detail, I'm picking an odd fish off. So I don't want any distractions. I want the fish 
to be able to see exactly what I've got on the hook. I'm not going to put a cast on the hook here, so why would I feed them? That's my mentality, right or wrong, who knows? But that's what I'm using today. Here at Southfield, I usually fish three lines. And at the weekend on the Feeder King, that was no different. So the short line was 10 meters sticked up, which obviously when you're sticking up, I go from the tip of the rod to the feeder, plus, plus the, the rod itself. So that'd be like 13 meters. And for that, I use a 10 foot rod. This one's set up slightly different to the rest because I actually have mono on the reel. This is a five pound or 20 mono. Because I'm fishing short, you could up big hybrids, there's odd crazy perch in here, there's odd big eels, and there's some really big bream. And when they pull you in, you just need that little bit of cushion that you get from the mono, so you make sure you don't get cracked off or lose the fish. You're fishing short, so bite detection isn't quite as important, because there's not as much line between you and the feeder. That's rod one. Rod two is what for I call the middle line. That's an 11 foot rod. This one's got braid on. It's got a fairly stiffish tip, like a one ounce tip, because the toe here can be unbelievable. If you get a left to right, unlike what you get today, and we'll talk about the wind in a moment, then you need something where you can actually still see the bite. You don't want your rod locked right round, because if you're looking for little indications, not always the bite, because more often than not, they'll pull you in. You just need to know whether there's fish in your peg. So it's a nice 11 foot rod, capable of casting probably 30 grams of feeder to the line that I fished, which was 32 and a half meters. Then the killer line, the most important line, especially as the year progresses, and obviously the final was on the 30th of September, the fish start to push out. The temperature cools and I think the fish just congregate towards the middle of the lake. This particular rod I set up at 50 meters. This is a 12 and a half foot with braid and quite importantly, a fairly short shot leader. That shot leader finishes, it's clipped up here and it finishes back here. So it's not even back onto the reel, but it will be when I cast in. I do that for maximum bite detection, but it just gives me the opportunity to put my rig on, and that's on an eight pound uh, mono main line, tied off here to the braid. That rod, really important because at the weekend on the match, it was right to left, very, very gentle wind, six, seven, eight mile an hour. Today, it's 14 miles an hour and it's right in your kisser. So it's important that you have a rod strong enough and powerful enough to be able to cast up to 50 grams. It can get that windy on here. So make sure that you're gunned up and you can reach your clip. 50 meters, really important. You, you can't waste your cast on this match. So we've touched on the tip choice what I've used in my rods and just a rule of thumb, because people kind of always ask me what, what the situation is. The overriding rule is that you need to fish with the lightest tip you can. However, what overrides that is, and most important, you need to be able to read your tip. So it's all well and good having a nice soft tip that feels nice when you put it in your rod, in your garage, but if you cannot read what's happening in your peg, then you're not gonna understand how to fish. So when you compare the difference between that one, which is a one ounce, an ounce and a half, up to two ounce, then that'll just, you can see them, there's a massive difference. So depending on the distance, I can get away with a lighter tip short, because there's less line between me and the feeder, and I'll pick up less tow. And then to the extreme, where I'm fishing with the 12 foot six at 50 meters, I've got a two ounce tip in there. Now that might seem extreme, because of course I'm talking about bite detection, but there's a lot of tow. And when that tip is bent in that tow, you still need to be able to read little indications. And on the weekend, on the final, you could actually see an odd little dink and that gave me the feeling and the knowledge that there's fish in your peg which then gives you the confidence to how you're fishing you know you can introduce more bait or you need to take less bait out if you're getting indications and you're not actually getting proper bites that means you might be doing it wrong you might have the wrong up bait on you might not be casting at the right intervals so reading your tip is absolutely massive tip choice mega mega important now i know you all set your rods up at home but only recently, on a big final down at Tamar, I actually, the, the conditions changed, it turned really windy. So I bit all my, my rigs off and I redid my tips on the bank to make sure that I'd got bite indication. Really important and a big tip for getting big match wins. The terminal rig, obviously mega important. My go-to rig here at Southfield is the sliding rig. It's a dead simple rig. Basically, my shot leader comes through I double it over, I've done this little rig uh, before, it's like a sliding uh, paternoster. Just tie it off, 
have a 250 mil drop beneath my stopper with a loop on where it attach me up length and basically I cast off what is a number eight stock which sits up against a knot and that is a dead simple rig and it helps you to read your bites when the fish pick it up you can see it and they don't feel the resistance I think that's perfect for all sizes of fish which you come across here at Southfield however I always have in the bag an identical rod with the famous helicopter rig on and the reason I have this is because on days like today which is obviously completely different to the final then you're casting into an headwind you sometimes get a few basically tangles with the sliding rig and the most important thing is when you're making a cast here because you're nicking fish you might be fishing sat there five six eight minutes waiting for a bite you want to know that your bait is fishing so that your rig is fishing it's not tangled up and the fish can't pick it up and give you an indication so the helicopter rig allows you to cast into an headwind you attach your feeder to the bottom i have two sets of like gummy stops with a quick change swivel that rotates in the wind when you're casting and that ensures that you're always fishing a good bait nice and clean and when they pick it up it's completely different on this rig you get that and it basically it's like a, a bolt rig and big it's not so good for small fish which is why i always choose the sliding rig but if you're catching bigger fish like i did then that rig will get you away in an headwind so it's an important thing to have as a backstop in case you need it when conditions change and go against you. I suppose one of the most important things is what you actually feed the fish on because let's be fair, if you don't feed the fish you ain't going to catch them. And you don't catch them unless they're eating what you're putting in. As I said earlier, one of the most important ingredients at Southfield is the worms. I've just finished chopping them and I've dropped them into a strainer so that I can manage the, the moisture content in my ground bait. So I think it's also important that you keep in control of your feeder because when you're um, trying to release bait quickly, you squeeze it softly. When you're trying to uh, keep your bait inside your feeder, if you're waiting for a bite, then you might want to squeeze that a little bit harder. You can only do that if you're in full control of the moisture content. If it's too soft, it'll just come out when it hits the surface and you, you basically then lose feeding and you're not focusing the fish's attention where you need it, which is on your rig. So that kind of leads me into uh, feeders. So my approach here at Southfield, as I said, is three lines. And when the shout time, I always put one feeder full out long on my long line because it's going to take me a little while to feed me other lines. So it's basically creating almost like a cast. So I just put one feeder full in. It's usually windy here at Southfield. It's quite a bit of a distance job. And what I like to use is one of those plastic bullet feeders like that. And that's a medium one where I can put a little bit of bait in to kickstart my peg. What I then do is I feed my middle line and I usually feed that with a bigger feeding feeder. And I'll put three kind of rich um, feeder fulls in with quite a bit of worm in because I'm going to use that to hold the fish and try and command that area. So if I didn't have to do that uh, one cast long, I would always feed that middle line. So I think that's kind of where the pleasure fishermen, I mean, there's people on here today, that's the sort of distance they ca cast, 25 to 35 metres. And I think the fish are used to being sat there. So I try and command that by putting some bait in there. And then what I do is I drop onto my short line where once again, I use a big feeder. And what I do with that is I don't actually put much uh, particle bait in, not too much rich. The reason for that is that I think that's a, a line where the fish come late on. I know some people don't feed that until they're ready to go on it. What I do as an alternative is I put ground bait in there so that I'm kind of making my mark, if you like. I'm letting the fish know that there's something there, but there's nothing to eat. And then when I want to go on it, I'll actually top that up with something rich, which could be um, obviously a few worms or when I really want to make them have it, I'll put, I'll put quite a bit of bait in. Then I suppose that then leads me on to feeder choice for fishing with. And basically, as you can see behind me today, the conditions are quite rough. So you need to be able to make sure you can get your bait there. Smaller bullet style feeders work really well here. And you want a feeder that you can actually, as I said, manipulate uh, how you feed because you want to sort of hold the bait in there. That's a great feeder, those X-Mesh feeders. They're a great choice here. They cut through the wind and they'll get you to 50 metres. Now, 
when you're feeder fishing, obviously you've, you've only got your feeder to control your bait. So think about the choice of feeder and what you're trying to do with it. And that then leads me on to the fact that always on my side tree here at Southfield, I have a couple of window feeders. I have one if I want to put some bait in. I use solids here more often than not. Or if I actually want to not feed any bait and I want to squeeze a bit of like sort of um, putty style ground bit into that, and basically, so to stop my peg being overfed, a little window feed is perfect for the middle line and sometimes for the long line if you can get it there. And then a slightly bigger, so 30 and 45 grams is usually the norm. You'll see I've got little, little bits, well, that one's actually got power gum on and that's got a little bit of braid on. And there, I don't use um, feeder links. I prefer to have my little link on my feed. And that just gives me a little, little bit of flexibility for when I get my bite to allow the rig to move and show that indication on my tip. As I said, reading your tips, everything. And then the only other feeder I use is when I come on my short line, I probably have already fed it, as I said at the start, and I'll have fed it then when I'm ready to go on it. And I'll just plop in there. That's a little zipper cage, small one in 15 gram. That'll go in nice and quiet because I'm trying to sneak up on a few fish that are sort of seeking sanctuary. They've come in close, don't want to scare them. And it's really important just to creep up on them with a nice light feeder. So it's quite simple, but yet quite varied. And I think that's probably an important thing to sort of stress that how you, how you feed your peg is, is everything. Because of course, when you've got fish in your peg and you've caught a few, they seem to back off here at Southfield. It's a shallow reservoir and you need to probably come off that line. And what I try and do is use my middle line and sometimes even my short line and I sacrifice periods of my match where maybe I, I don't even think I'm going to catch on the short line, for instance, but I'll come on that to breathe the other two to allow the fish to regroup because obviously the pegs, you know, are quite close on Southfield. The fish have got nowhere to go. So by creating a quiet area, that allows them to come back to you away from the anglers who are who keep ploughing their pegs and they'll settle up and in this instance on Saturday when I left my long line for an, uh, nearly an hour I went back on and I got one first chuck and I usually try and creep up on them with a window feeder I find that really effective and you're just letting them settle and then you're going in and you're pinching one you can then start the process again with your sort of bullet feeders where you're putting some bait in and reset your peg so think about what's happening with the fish Swim management is absolutely massive and using feeders to introduce bait or not introduce bait as the case may be is a really, really important part and a fantastic tip to get you where you need to be. Now, down to the business end and what ultimately must be said is the most important part of your fishing because for you to catch a fish, it's got to take your hook bait in its mouth. Now, I think the most effective and most consistent bait at Southfield has got to be the red worm. Don't ask me what it is. I don't know if it's the flavour inside them, the fact that they obviously come from horse manure, uh, or whether it's the fact that they wriggle and that one's actually wriggling that much, I'm going to take it off. So a fantastic bait here at Southfield is two full red worms. And what I like to do with my red worms is basically hook them in the head, but then something that I find works for me really well is to nip off the tails. You can do it the other way around, you can nip off the heads and leave the tails on, but I like to just hook them through the head where it's nice and tough. But look at look at that. I mean, it's wriggling its head off. What bream or self-respecting fish in here could resist that? That's a fantastic bait, especially when it's not really moving around much, there's not much tow and the fish aren't down and they're feeding. When they're cruising around and they're just picking up baits up, I think a red worm will attract them. They know it's there, they can sense it. That's what I believe, I don't know if it's true or not. And they'll nip down and they'll grab that. And so many times when it's been hard and I'm searching for one fish, that is one of the best up baits ever. Obviously, we're feeding dendrobinas, like I said, chop worms. And in my mind, as I said earlier, I don't really like putting things on the hook that I'm not feeding. So obviously, another great bait is Dendrobina. And with the same hook, this is a 14 B5, Camasan B560. And I like those hooks here because when you're fishing big baits like two red worms, sometimes even three, 
you need your point of your hook to be exposed. Because when they're coming in, they're grabbing, they're stabbing, and they're not particularly sort of big fish that are swimming through and they're swimming off. They're kind of pecking at your bait, I believe, here at Southfield. Then you need quite a bit of hook point exposed. And at the moment, and especially at the weekend, there were lots and lots of small roach, which is fantastic to see, but it meant that they were pecking at your bait. So sometimes you need to just fish a slightly bigger bait, and a hook like that will just allow you to fish quite a big section of dendrobina, which is obviously the bait that you're feeding through your feeder, and they'll get used to that. To keep those small fish away, another great bait, and it's the reason why I always bring them, is two or three fluorescent maggots. They're highly visible. You can, and I like to hook mine top and tail, so I don't hook them all through the thick end. I'll usually put one through the thick end and two through the thin end. And in the past, and at the weekend that got me a couple of fish as well. That bright visible bait, and it's up to you whether you fish them live or dead. I think sometimes uh, if there's some small fish there, dead ones are better because they can't, I think it's because they can't bust the bait. Whereas when it's a, a live maggot, they can bite it and bust it and it, then it, the bait's gone and it's blown. Whereas with the dead, if you put them on dead sometimes, that just stops the little fish from being able to uh, bite it and squash it and allows your bait to sit there. But I mean, look at that, that's a fantastic bait. Target baits is what I call them. The fish need to be able to see what they're doing and here, they're on the hunt, they come in, they're a bit spooky because it's shallow. They're in, they grab it and they're gone. And those three up baits, absolutely massive. And think about what baits you're doing and think about how the fish are feeding. And if they're feeding more um, confidently, and you're getting liners, which is not something that happens at Southfield, but if you're in another bream water, then think about the fish and how they're feeding. If they're pecking at it, smaller up baits might be quite effective because they're picking up all your particles, but not here at Southfield. I think it's target baits. And they are important parts of your army for catching fish. The next thing is small, but mega important. The humble stopwatch. For me, that's probably the most important thing that I've mentioned today because timings especially when you're bream fishing are everything and it's not just because oh i'm going to fish every five minutes but what can happen is and southfield's a great example when that fear hits the water you set the stopwatch and when you look at your fish and you look down at your stopwatch and you'll see that it's two and a half minutes it don't mean anything but the second second time you do it and it's two and a half minutes or the third time you do it and it's three minutes you start to build a picture of what the fish are doing. Because when you're casting in, and I talked to you earlier about how you squeeze your feeder, how much bait you put in that, how much bait's released, the fish will react differently to that. It's not quite as simple and straightforward as you throw it in and there's these fish here and then they just come and sometimes they come straight to it, sometimes it takes them a while to come to it. Other fish backing off when your feeder lands and then coming back inquisitively. And I believe, especially at Southfield, the size of the fish is they, they react completely differently and they'll give you different bite times. So sometimes and quite often you're catching these eight ounce to a pound skimmers, they can give a bite really, really quickly. And you'll get to build a picture and you'll build like a portfolio of bite times. And then as that can change through the day, you'll notice it more because you've got a stopwatch. So you're constantly monitoring and controlling what you're doing. And yeah, I suppose that sounds quite obvious and quite simple. But think about the fact that if you're casting in regular and you're just mindlessly filling your feeder with either just ground bait or you're, and you, you might be using casters for, different to me, that the quicker the bite times, the more bait you're putting in. So by monitoring how quick you're casting and how quick you're catching, then lets you know what you're building up in your peg. And on a venue like this, if it's a slow, odd fish day, Personally, um, on the Feeder King, I only had eight fish. So I don't really need to feed tons to catch those fish. And my bite times were quite long. So a stopwatch is not just, you know, oh, I have five minute casts. It creates a story, it creates a graph that you can mentally build up in your mind to allow you to manage your swim and get the most out of it. Because trust me, the fish are very unpredictable and that will help you to monitor them on a given day. So make sure you've got one and use it wisely. 
So we already touched on distances, but I'm just going to go into those in a little bit more detail. Now, three lines is always the way that I fish at Southfield. Some people only use two lines and because they can't always manage that. So you have to do what's right for you. But obviously I want to talk to you about what I did and, and where I fished. So my short line, which was with my feeders lining 13 metres from my box, 10 metres sticked up, plus obviously the length of the rod. That line, I never had a bite on that line, uh, and I only went on it once. And th that's really important, you know, to reflect back on one of the tips, which is swim management and timings. But what I like about a line, even if I don't believe it's going to go around, is that it gives me the chance to fish somewhere and rest, because you don't want to be just one your rod and put it down on the thing, that, that's obvious. But by the same token, you don't want to sit on a line too long and keep thumping that feeder in over the top of what might be resting fish. So the third line for me, more often than not, whichever line that may be, is the one where it allows me to break away from my swims. In warmer times, I mean, obviously this final was the 30th of September, your uh, short line can be really good. I think more pleasure fishermen come onto the res, a lot of people fish a pole, some people fish a waggler and they throw bait and lose feed, and the fish come right into that. But as autumn comes and the weather starts to cool down, for whatever reason, I think the fish back off further out into the res. So that then took, leads me on to my, my middle line, my second line, which is, for me, was 32 and a half metres. And again, in the summer, sometimes that might be 25 to 30 metres, but I pushed it past 30 metres because I believed that the fish were 30 to 55 metres. So I tried to bring my second and third line as close as I dare, uh, leaving a gap for resting and, and sort of separation, but pushing them as close as I could. And I think, um, that can be a fantastic line, but I never know before the start which of those two lines this time of year are going to be the one. And as it happened uh, at the weekend, it was uh, the 50 metre line that obviously where I caught most of my fish because I think the fish were all on that line and some people go even further than that. And, and I spoke to a few people after who said, well, I had a long line at 60 and, and I did this and that usually works for me. But here's a little point that I think works at Southfield. It's flat, it's like a football pitch. It's only three and a half, four foot deep, all the way across. There's no fish holding features. So I think, like cattle or you know, uh, animals, they roam up and down and they go up and down in a line. So if you're fishing a random line on your own and the fish are moving from swim to swim, because as you know, it's quite tight pegging and everybody's fishing the same, I almost call it like a bridge. So I don't try and fish out on my own. I try and fish on a line that I think other people are gonna fish. So that as the fish drift from their peg onto the next, they're gonna cross my bait as they go. So the 50 meter line, I think is a very common line. The fish, it's far enough out to hold the fish, but it's close enough to other people who are fishing 45, 48, 50, and up to 55 meters to catch that passing traffic of bream and skimmers. And for me, that was the line. That's where I caught most of my fish. So. I think, think about your lines, think about what happens on a regular basis on a venue, and think about the wind, the weather, and the temperature, and use those uh, bits of information to create the swim that you're gonna fish to be more productive. It's as simple as that. The last and final tip has got nothing to do with tackle, hooks, feeders, worms, maggots, ground bait, nothing to do with that, it's to do with you. And the biggest thing that I believe helps me with my fishing is an open mind. And when I mean, what, I, what I mean by that is that leading up to the event of the Feeder King, uh, I came on the Wednesday practice and I had a preconceived idea that when you come to Southfield, you're catching small skimmers and an odd bream and you're casting regular and you're pinching fish and you're three casts on that line and three... And that's the norm. And when people ask me, oh, what, what shall I... I've got a match on it, so and so and such and such. What shall I do? Well, fishing's not like that. It's not a fixed uh, set menu. It does, it, fish are creatures, animals. They do what they please. The weather does what it wants. So you have to keep an open mind when you're approaching uh, pleasure fishing, match fishing, big events. They're all the same. So leading up to the match, came on the Wednesday and uh, my partner, Lee Kerry, um, he was fishing the practice match along with myself. And he caught small skimmers in the traditional Southfield style. And I caught some bigger fish in a more considered approach. And leading up to the match and the night before, and even on the peg, 
I kept an open mind that, this, that my peg could be either or. And by doing that and feeling my way into the match, that allowed me to adjust accordingly and get the best from my swim. So what I'm saying to you is the best tip of them all is don't decide the day before, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and be hard and fast and stubborn. Open up your mind, think about what the fish are doing, look at what other people are doing, read the bank, read the water, read the fish. And that, in my opinion, will give you more success, more fish in the net, and hopefully it'll lead you to great victories in competitions.